In this video, we're going to focus on Kuma's life journey, diving deep into his profound love for Bonnie, his background as a member of the Seven Warlords of the Sea, and shining a spotlight on Kizaru's inner thoughts. We'll revisit Kuma's past and see how his deep affection for Bonnie highlights the multifaceted nature of his character. The story behind his joining the Seven Warlords of the Sea intertwines his complex life with the political aspects of the One Piece world. Moreover, we'll delve deeply into Kizaru's actions and his true feelings, analyzing their significance, a topic that's particularly intriguing to fans in Japan. In this video, I'll be translating these insightful discussions from Japanese fans into English, making them accessible to our American audience. If you discover the deep message hidden in Kuma's life, don't forget to hit like and subscribe to the channel. Also, share your thoughts in the comments, especially if you're surprised by Kizaru's real intentions. Please note, this video contains spoilers up to episode 1100 of the series. Now, let's dive right into the details. In the last episode, number 1099 of One Piece, Dr. Vegapunk made a pivotal proposal. Using Kuma as a subject for a human modification in exchange for treating Bonnie. This was a critical decision for both Kuma and Bonnie, adding a layer of drama to the story. Kuma accepted Vegapunk's offer, but there was more to this deal than met the eye. Saint Saturn felt that Vegapunk's proposal was insufficient and pointed out the enormous cost involved. He then demanded the addition of three more conditions to Vegapunk's proposal, which further complicated the narrative. One of these conditions was to join the Seven Warlords of the Sea, a direct consequence of Ace's previous actions in defeating one of them. This vacancy in the Seven Warlords created by Ace's exploits was a significant plot point in the story. Interestingly, in Episode 552, during Whitebeard's flashback, it was revealed that Ace had been invited to join the Seven Warlords. This piece of information is crucial in understanding Ace's character and his role in the grand scheme of things. Ace had been invited to join the Seven Warlords precisely because he had defeated one of them. Despite appearing less powerful compared to figures like King or Katakuri of the Four Emperors, Ace was actually quite formidable. Not only was Ace on par with Jinbei, but he also had the strength to defeat a member of the Seven Warlords, proving himself to be a warrior of their caliber. This revelation highlights Ace's true strength and status within the world of One Piece. In a scene where the news of Kuma joining the Seven Warlords of the Sea is read, the figure of Blackbeard is also depicted. This portrayal is an example of the intricate narrative structure of One Piece. Blackbeard, once a subordinate of Ace, was aware of the fact that those who defeat a Seven Warlord are often invited to become one. Hidden behind this is Blackbeard's cunning plan. Two years prior, during his infiltration into Impel Down, he desired the title of a Seven Warlord. To achieve this, he targeted Luffy's head, capitalizing on the fact that Luffy had defeated Crocodile. Possible candidates for the Seven Warlord defeated by Ace included Captain John and Silver Axe from the former Rocks Pirates. These figures, alongside names like Whitebeard, Kaido, and Big Mom, rose to fame after the God Valley incident. The prowess of Captain John and Silver Axe was likely of the Four Emperor's caliber, a significant point to consider in the power dynamics of the One Piece world. Furthermore, it's highly possible that the top echelons of the world government and the Navy knew about Ace being Roger's son. Ace belonged to the D-Clan, often referred to as the natural enemy of gods. Despite this, the fact that Ace was invited to join the Seven Warlords indicates that the world government sought powerful individuals for the positions, regardless of lineage. Ace's ability to defeat a Seven Warlord within just a year at sea was a testament to his inherent talent, hard work, and the power of the Flame Flame Fruit. Currently, Sabo, who carries on Ace's will and wields the Flame Flame Fruit, will likely find this power a significant aid in his upcoming battles against the top brass of the world government and the Navy. The conditions added by Saint Saturn to Dr. Vegapunk's proposal were profoundly serious. First, Kuma was to join the Seven Warlords of the Sea. Secondly, he himself would become a human weapon for the Navy. Most critically, he was to ultimately relinquish all of his thoughts and self-awareness. These conditions demanded an incredibly heavy decision from Kuma, especially the loss of his identity, 
which is akin to a death of his humanity. In addition to these conditions, Kuma was forbidden from meeting Bonnie, with her complete freedom only granted once Kuma lost his self-awareness, a severe limitation. If you strip a cyborg of human will, they're just a robot. Are you asking me to kill a person? Dr. Vegapunk. While the first and second conditions might be somewhat understandable, the third, as Vegapunk points out, essentially means death. Nevertheless, Kuma resolved to accept any fate for Bonnie's life. Thank you. If it cures Bonnie's illness, I'll accept any destiny. Bartholomew Kuma. This represented Kuma's acceptance of his fate and his strong will, expressing gratitude even towards Saint Saturn, who had tormented him for so long, all for the sake of saving Bonnie. From Kuma's decision, it's clear how important Bonnie is to him. He is prepared to accept any harsh condition for the sake of Bonnie's life. As we will discuss in later detail, Kizaru, who is observing this exchange, seemed surprised by Kuma's resolution. It appeared that Kizaru was deeply moved by Kuma's strong will and spirit of self-sacrifice. I ordered it, Vegapunk. I will never allow self-awareness to remain. St. J. Garcia Saturn. But then, Kuma will. Dr. Vegapunk. This dialogue, appearing in episode 1994, seemed to be between Dr. Vegapunk and St. Saturn. Vegapunk opposed the removal of Kuma's self-awareness until the very end. Also, in the lower left corner of the first page of episode 1100, a figure who appears to be Drake is depicted, suggesting he accompanied Kizaru on his visit to Egghead. It might be good to fight, knowing the inside story. The despair might be greater, don't you think? Kizaru In episode 509, Kizaru informed Drake about the inner workings of the pacifista, implying Drake was aware of the tragedy that befell Kuma. And after parting with Bonnie, it's highly likely that Drake witnessed Kuma being stripped of his self-awareness. This incident might have been a catalyst for Drake joining S.W.O.R.D. The flashbacks of Kuma's life depicted so far have given us deep insights into the tragedies inflicted by the world government, including the loss of his loved ones like his parents and Ginny, the God Valley incident, and the political darkness of the Sorbet Kingdom. These experiences led Kuma to establish the revolutionary army with Dragon and Ivankov to oppose the world government. It was assumed that Kuma harbored deep resentment against the world government. However, the dealings with Saint Saturn in episode 1100 show that Kuma, instead of harboring resentment, is grateful for the curing of Bonnie's illness. The last thing we need is for that power to be directed at the world government, Saint J. Garcia Saturn. Saint Saturn added the condition to erase Kuma's self-awareness out of caution towards him. Since the God Valley incident, Saint Saturn had been wary of Kuma, disseminating misinformation about him. When Kuma visited Vegapunk for Bonnie's sake, Saint Saturn could have threatened Kuma through Kizaru or used Bonnie as a hostage. Instead, he chose to negotiate seriously with Kuma about Bonnie's illness. Despite the dark aspects of the world government portrayed in the Egghead arc, the interaction between Saint Saturn and Kuma suggests that the world government might be a negotiable entity. It indicates that the narrative of One Piece might not culminate in the complete downfall of the world government as absolute evil. In the Egghead arc, we saw Kizaru targeting his friend Vegapunk without hesitation and fighting closely with Sentomaru. These depictions suggest that while advocating ambiguous justice, he seemed to have a philosophy close to Akainu, with little emotional fluctuation. However, episode 1100 revealed a different side of Kizaru, showing him eating pizza and dancing with Vegapunk, Sentomaru, Bonnie, and Kuma indicating a more human side than previously thought. Kizaru's surprise at Kuma's willingness to accept any fate for Bonnie's sake further reveals his depth. His friendly interactions with Kuma, a pirate, suggest that he does not view pirates as inherently evil. Spare me. This is my job. Kizaru. This line reveals Kizaru's internal struggle, being friends with Vegapunk, yet troubled by his naval duties involving dealings with pirates. It seems Kizaru suppresses his personal feelings and emotions while carrying out the government's dirty work. From this, 
it becomes clear that Kizaru is not just a person with minimal emotional fluctuations and an ideology close to a kainu, but in reality, he harbors many conflicts within himself. Don't make me hurt an acquaintance outside of duty. Kizaru This statement by Kizaru in episode 1092 reveals his reluctance to harm others outside of his duties, suggesting he suppresses personal feelings while carrying out his mission. Reflecting on the events at Saba Odi Archipelago two years prior, Kizaru never confronted Bonnie. This could be a mere coincidence, but it might also indicate a considerate side of Kizaru and Sentomaru. Viewing it from the perspective of Kizaru suppressing personal feelings for duty, it's conceivable that he might reach a breaking point, potentially abandoning his mission or even quitting the Navy in the future. Meanwhile, Kuma, Vegapunk, Kizaru, Sentamaro, and Bonnie shared joyful moments. After enjoying a large pizza together, Kuma taught them the dance of the Buccaneers, Don Don Dots, to which everyone danced in silhouettes reminiscent of their celebration in Skypea. The Don Don Dots rhythm, significant to Kuma and Vegapunk, might play an essential role in the climax of the Egghead arc, resonating as a treasured memory rhythm for them. Bonnie's surgery took six months, during which she stayed at Egghead. After surgery, Bonnie was to spend a year of convalescence in her homeland, Sorbet Kingdom, under strict conditions imposed by Saint Saturn, who threatened, From post-surgery, any contact or escape with the girl is forbidden. If violated, she will be demoted to slavery. Thus, the farewell in Sorbet Kingdom marked by permanent separation for Kuma and Bonnie. Looking back at Bonnie's past and timeline, Dragon Statement Recently, his laboratory seems to be relocating after the accident, indicates their reunion at Punk Hazard post Caesar's accident, roughly four years ago. After reuniting with the Revolutionary Army, Kuma must have visited Vegapunk, and Bonnie was expected to regain her freedom two and a half years ago, following a year and a half of recovery. When I heard you had fled from the government, it sent a chill down my spine, but it's all over now," remarked Akaino in episode 595. This implies that during her convalescence in Sorbet Kingdom, Bonnie managed to elude surveillance and escape. Within about a year, she grew into a renowned bounty head, paralleling Luffy as a supernova, a testament to her rigorous training since childhood. Moreover, episode 1098 reveals that Bonnie was five years old seven years ago meaning she was 10 when wanted, suggesting her illness, as Kuma falsely informed her, was cured by age 10. In episode 498, when Bonnie first appeared, we see two men attempting to rescue Kuma from imprisonment by King Bagoli 22 years ago, alongside Ginny. These two, having a deep connection with Kuma since childhood, likely aided Bonnie's escape from the world government during her recovery and continued to support her after becoming a pirate. Two years ago, when Bonnie arrived at Saba Odi Archipelago, Kuma was also present. As stated by Kizaru in episode 513, Kuma was not officially summoned to Saba Odi, indicating his unsanctioned appearance there. Even that the first place Bartholomew Kuma appeared was where Luffy and his crew were, it's believed that his main objective was to save Luffy, the son of Dragon. Knowing that Luffy was at Saba Odi Archipelago, Kuma must have been aware of Bonnie's presence there too. However, Due to St. Saturn's stern warning that meeting Bonnie would result in her enslavement, Kuma, despite being near her, feared causing her misfortune and ultimately did not meet her. As Gecko Moria stated in episode 474, Look at Kuma, the tyrant, the only seven warlord completely subservient to the government. It's likely Kuma obeyed the government's orders to protect Bonnie. At that time in Sabaody, Kuma still had his self-will but Saint Saturn's threat prevented him from reuniting with Bonnie. This means that even if Kuma regains his self-will, he won't meet Bonnie unless her safety is assured. However, the current situation is different with powerful allies like the Straw Hat Pirates, now one of the four emperors, and the strengthened Revolutionary Army, rendering Saint Saturn's threat almost ineffective. This significantly increases the possibility of a reunion between Kuma and Bonnie who thought they would never meet again. Kuma's destination after leaving Kamabaka Kingdom and climbing the Red Line might have been Egghead, where Bonnie is. If his target had been Mary Joa, 
he would have landed without colliding with the red line. Therefore, his destination might be Egghead in the first half of the Grand Line, behind the red line, driven by his sole desire to meet Bonnie, even in his will-less state. Bartholomew Kuma's joining the Seven Warlords of the Sea sent shockwaves through pirates worldwide, as mentioned in episode 1100. Though a deal with one of the five elders, St. J. Garcia Saturn, Kuma became a member of the Seven Warlords. This completed the full roster of the Seven Warlords at the start of the One Piece story. As you all know, while the Seven Warlords are sanctioned pirates allowed to plunder non-world government nations, not all of them blindly follow the government's orders. Imagine the impact of someone like Kuma, with top-tier strength among the Seven Warlords, obediently executing the government's commands. This would surely increase the government and Navy's influence, making it harder for pirates like Ace to challenge the Seven Warlords. In fact, the first to break this ironclad grip of the Seven Warlords was Luffy, two years later. This signifies that the menace of the Seven Warlords, comparable at one point even to the Four Emperors, was greatly amplified by Kuma's involvement. Kuma's subsequent assaults on numerous non-aligned nations also played a significant role. The nickname Tyrant, given to Kuma, following the claims of King Beko, whom he harmed, was part of a negative campaign by the world government. However, Kuma, who believed he was unfit to be a king, likely didn't mind or care much about being called a tyrant. With the appointment of the new Seven Warlord, Bartholomew Kuma, the other members of the Seven Warlords of the Sea each had their unique reactions. Notably, Don Quixote do Flamingo remarked, Tyrant? Kuma? Another bad guy has appeared. Do Flamingo, a character who believes that the powerful define justice, had his own manipulative control over Dressrosa. He might have felt a certain sympathy for Kuma, who was also labeled as a tyrant. Let's turn to Crocodile's reaction. He seemed indifferent, busy looking for witnesses related to the dance powder incident in Alabasta. Meanwhile, the world's strongest swordsman, Mihawk, quietly checked the news about Kuma, showing no particular reaction. Focusing on Jinbei, he was then under Whitebeard's banner, discussing Kuma with Ace, Marco, Blackbeard, and others. Jinbei, your successor has been decided. That's good for you, Ace commented, to which Jinbei reacted. This scene reveals our strong camaraderie among the crew. Jinbei himself appeared to have mixed feelings about a king becoming a seven warlord possibly reflecting his stance as a fishman oppressed by the world government's growing power. Boa Hancock, prior to her fateful encounter and subsequent infatuation with Luffy, displayed her characteristic haughty empress demeanor. In contrast, Gecko Moria showed interest in the powers of the pawpaw fruit, but ultimately spent most of his time lazing around in bed, reflecting his dependent nature. These reactions underscore the onset of the golden era of the Seven Warlords with Kuma's induction, particularly for the new generation of pirates like Luffy, who now had formidable new targets. The direct involvement of the Five Elders in negotiating Kuma's induction highlights the significant esteem held for the Seven Warlords position. Moreover, Kuma's inclusion, despite his origin from the Buccaneer tribe and under the direct control of the world government, emphasizes the crucial role of the Warlords. Despite the dissolution of the Seven Warlords system by Fujitora, the potential emergence of a new breed of seven warlords, centered around the Seraphim, indicates that the narrative role of the seven warlord system in the story is far from over. Under the world government's orders, Bartholomew Kuma, located in East Blue, ironically continued to execute missions while gradually losing his personality. Loyal to the world government's commands, Kuma's fate led him to Fusha Village, where he closely approached the offshore area where Luffy remained after the departures of Sabo and Ace. This behavior of Kuma suggests he was assigned a special mission by the world government. The still enigmatic connection between Kuma and Luffy is hinted at, especially after the events in Saba Odi Archipelago, indicating that Kuma regarded Luffy as Dragon's son in a special way. The mission in Fusha Village likely became a turning point for Kuma to recognize Luffy's significance more profoundly. Furthermore, during his mission, Kuma might have realized that the gum gum fruit consumed by Luffy could be related to the legendary liberator Nika. In Chapter 1096, Kuma, believing in the Buccaneer tribe's legend of the liberator Nika, declared to Saint Saturn at God Valley his intention to save people like Nika. Kuma, 
In his attempt to save Bonnie, chose to forsake his own dreams and comply with the world government's orders. The array of tragedies that struck Kuma speaks volumes of his deep despair as he gradually transformed into a cyborg, losing his personality. This journey highlights the extent of Kuma's suffering and internal conflict. What impact might there be if Kuma, in such a state, encountered Luffy, known as the embodiment of Nika? Kuma's father, Clap, imparted to his son the rhythm of the liberation drum, the so-called Don Don beat. This rhythm, often shared by Kuma with Bonnie and Vegapunk, signifies its importance. Particularly about three and a half years ago, in chapter 1100, if Luffy, albeit unawakened, had echoed the rhythm of the liberation drum, Kuma might have sensed the presence of Nika within him. This suggests that Kuma regarded Luffy in a special light. It is plausible that Kuma, even in his final moments of losing his personality, continued to support Luffy, harboring the spirit of the liberator Nika. The next encounter between Kuma and Luffy might reveal Kuma's current intentions and purposes. Furthermore, Kuma's acquaintances like Kizaru, Sentamaru, Vegapunk, and Bonnie might be influenced by the rhythm of the liberation drum, potentially marking the inception of a literal revolution. So that's my analysis. But what do you all think? Well, that's all for today. This channel posts summaries, explanations, and ranking videos related to One Piece. If you like One Piece, we would be happy if you could support us by subscribing to our channel and commenting. Thank you for watching till the end. See you in the next video.